All right, so let's do this. Uh, it feels like it's been forever since we've been here for a normal lecture, huh? Um, I don't know what kind of witchcraft you all pulling uh, last week, but that was ridiculous on Friday. I can't even tell you how strange that is. First of all, to even have snow where I live, never mind to let it stick, never mind to have it be in April. But also, I have a truck specifically to drive in the snow because we go skiing every weekend. And it just so happened to be the one day that my husband is out of town with our truck on a work trip. So anyways, I know everybody's super bummed out that we couldn't start in on this new unit uh, on Friday, but that's what we'll be doing here today, all right? What we're gonna be doing is taking a lot of time to talk about the structure of individual atoms. We talked last, or, you know, last unit about the structures of molecules, these compounds that we get when we stick atoms together. Uh, now we're gonna focus just on the individual atoms themselves, okay? And it might seem a little weird to put this topic after the discussion of molecular structures, but truthfully, I put it at the end because it's one of the easier topics that we cover in this course, all right? And I know what everybody just heard me say is that they don't have any work to do to learn this material. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, and compared to molecular structures, this isn't too bad of stuff here, all right? So we're talking about the structure of individual atoms. And this was something that uh, you know, piqued chemist, cur uh, chemist curiosity pretty early on. In the 1800s, they had established that the world around us was made of atoms, right? That was something that was sort of thrown around for a little bit, but we didn't have experimental evidence that that was the hard, fast truth until the early 1800s, a scientist named John Dalton. Um, you don't have to know these names or dates, but they are kind of interesting. Uh, what they thought of when they established that the world was made of atoms was simply that atoms, they pictured in their head that atoms were just teeny tiny marbles. Right? These teeny, teeny, tiny hard sphere objects. And that's not a bad approximation, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. The first thing that was established was that these atoms were composed of these subatomic particles. Right? We know our protons are positively charged, our neutrons are neutral, and our electrons are negatively charged. Right? So the discovery of these subatomic particles, the building blocks of atoms, were kind of the next addition to that theory. And they had, they called it this plum pudding model, where basically they imagined all those, uh, all those particles were just smudged together within this sphere moving around. And then further experimentation, they established that actually there was the nucleus of the atom that existed, right? So the neutrons and the protons live in the very center of the atom. And most of the atom is actually this empty space where the electrons live, all right? And then, finally, Niels Bohr came along and established what's called the planetary model. All right, so now they have this picture in their head of this nucleus at the center, much like we have the sun in the center of our solar system. And the electrons are orbiting around that sun, right, around that center nucleus. And the big part here, the big difference between this and the previous model were the idea that electrons have energy levels associated with them. So within an atom, not all electrons are created equal. There are some electrons that are higher energy and some electrons that are lower energy, all right? So not all of these electrons are created equal when we're in an atom, all right? There was a big problem with this planetary model that they kind of knew right off the bat. They had this experimental evidence about this different energy level business, and this is how they kind of made sense of it. But the problem is, is that our solar system isn't gonna last forever. It has like this physics problem to it. We are all slowly spiraling in to the center of our solar system, slowly spiraling into that sun. And if we kind of shrink this down and put this on the molecular scale, for us, we're not worried about it because it's gonna take forever to happen. And we're moving relatively slow. But electrons are moving really fast. So why aren't they just gonna spiral into the center of this atom here, okay? And so what happened is around that same time, early 1900s, what's going on in the rest of the world are these world wars. And it sounds really kind of gruesome to say, but these world wars were a boon for science because for the first time, governments are throwing huge amounts of money at chemists and physicists because they're trying to get an edge in this war. And so this is really the first time that these government-run science programs start to creep up around the world. And we're really throwing money at physics and chemistry. And one big thing that happens at this time is the establishment of what's called quantum mechanics. I think everybody in here has heard of Einstein, right? What's Einstein's claim to fame, along with another group of scientists around that same time, is the establishment of quantum physics, okay? Uh, quantum physics we're not going to do here in this class because it is a next level of math. 
This math that you've been learning in your calculus class, all using this x, y, z coordinate system, that's a specific type of math. And if you go on and you do quantum mechanics, it actually requires a different type of math. It's called operator theory. It's just the next kind of level up. And it turned out that they needed that more complicated way to, uh, you know, more complicated math in order to better understand the universe. Okay? That classical physics, that calculus that you're learning, does a really, really good job of explaining most of the universe until you start talking about things that are really, really tiny and moving really, really fast. And it turns out that that cl uh, classical physics just doesn't apply to the world inside an atom. A really simple example would be if I were to chuck this pencil across the room and hit that back wall, there'd be no way for me to get this pencil from here to there without it crossing through the middle of the room, right? Electrons, they don't have that same behavior. They can move from here to there without ever passing through the middle. All right, there's this little magical world of quantum mechanics that's happening when things are really tiny and moving around really fast. And it just doesn't quite obey what we're doing here in this bigger, slower world that we live in. We're gonna talk a little bit about quantum mechanics and about these weird phenomena that arise from quantum mechanics. But again, it's really a big, ugly math theory that we just don't have the tools to really fully explain. So you're gonna hear a little bit about that theory here and there, but we're not gonna go into the depths of it because it's just ridiculously beyond our math level at this point, all right? And so anyways, all that to say that when they've established that theory of quantum mechanics, they used it to predict what an atom looks like and that is our modern model of an atom, what's called the quantum model, all right? So they basically treated an atom as a big, ugly math problem, a big physics problem, all right? So we can even look at that equation here. This is what's called the Schrodinger equation. Looks super simple, right? Great, so this is what we do when we're trying to figure out the physics of an atom. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna solve for what's happening with the electron in that atom. We're gonna solve for what's called this wave function here. And when we get it, we get our wave function for our atom, which is this thing right here. All right, so let's use this equation. No, I'm kidding, we're not, we're not gonna do that. But the bottom line here is what we're gonna be talking about is this big, ugly math problem. And that's gonna be important to keep in mind because we're gonna start talking about these orbitals and these shapes, and it's like, where the hell did this come from? How do they know this is true? It's this big, ugly math problem here. This is what we're going to be talking about kind of qualitatively, not going into the weeds and actually doing the math here. All right, so the quantum mechanical model of an atom, that's what we're gonna be talking about here. Whoops. All right, so first of all, the nucleus of that atom is the boring part, to where the protons and the neutrons live, all right? So first of all, we kind of talked about this at the beginning. Now let's go back and revisit here. We talked about how we have a nucleus of our atom. This is where all of the mass of the atom lives. So that would be the dense part of our atom here, where all of the mass of that atom is. And we have our protons and our neutrons stuck together in this little ball we call the nucleus of the atom. So you can just kind of imagine here if we do our protons in blue and our neutrons in red here, the nucleus of an atom are just these particles smashed together, forming this dense ball at the center of our atom. The electrons, they live on the outside of the nucleus. And it turns out that these electrons have their own structure to them. We talked about how they have their own energy levels, right? These energy levels are gonna to correspond to different structures of those electrons. Okay, so outside the nucleus.
This is where our electrons live in what are called orbitals. And we're going to talk about these orbitals. These orbitals are what that big ugly math function told us here. All right, how we can think about an orbital more simply is like an electron cage. So it's like this little cage where these electrons are trapped in. All right. So we're going to talk about a few different types of orbitals. The first one that we're going to talk about is the simplest, what's called the S orbital. All right, S orbital, all of our orbitals are going to have different shapes associated with them. Our S orbitals are spherically shaped. All right, in terms of like the intuitiveness of what an atom looks like, this would be the most intuitive looking orbital here. Our electrons are trapped in this spherical shell around our central nucleus, right? So they're allowed to move freely, but within this little bubble that we got here. All right, and so really, if we look at that big, ugly math equation, what that big, ugly math equation is doing is telling us the probability of where we would find an electron in this atom, okay? So first weird thing about quantum mechanics, it's impossible to establish exactly where an electron is. Instead, we can only say what the probability of finding an electron in a certain place is. Again, not something that classical mechanics did. Classical mechanics was all about the x, y, z coordinates of something. Quantum mechanics is like, look, we're not even going to try. We're not even going to try to figure out exactly where this electron is. We're just going to predict the probability of finding it in a specific location. So if you take that big, ugly equation and you plot out all those probabilities, you get this spherical shape here, where it's more probable to find the electron in the very center. Probable. That's why it's got that dense sort of set of dots there. And then it gets less and less probable the further away you go. All right, so that big ugly equation, if we take it and we plot all those probabilities, we get this spherical shape here. And of course, this is 2D on the page here, but you want to imagine a sphere, a 3D shape. Um, more likely, the way that you're going to see these pictured, the way that we're going to represent these, are to just put like a hard shell on it. And again, to imagine that that probability function is really just like a cage, a cage where those electrons are trapped, right? So again, our electrons are trapped in this spherical shaped S orbital. Okay, so that's kind of the most intuitive one. Yes, our electrons are able to move around our atom, but they do so in this kind of spherical shell. But there's other orbitals that fall out of that big ugly math equation. One of them is the P orbitals. Okay, these have this peanut shape associated with them. And again, these are just these orbitals. These are these electron cages. We have our electrons that are trapped. They're able to move around this little cage here, right? But they're trapped in that peanut shape, okay? So again, we call these P orbitals, and we're going to remember the shape of these orbitals of a P orbital simply as being peanut shaped. Okay, now there is one S orbital. There are actually three different P orbitals here. We call them PX, PY, and PZ. You just got to remember that there are three of them. If you look at them, they all have the exact same shape. They're all still peanut shaped orbitals. The difference is just the way that they're oriented in space. So there's three of these peanut shape orbitals. One of them's straight up and down. The other one's left to right, and the other one's forward to back, right? So these are these same three peanut shaped orbitals just oriented differently in space, okay? Um, one of the amazing things about this, if you remember me talking about how electrons are different than my pen in that I could toss my pen across the room, but it's gotta pass through the middle here. Our p orbital tells us that our electron can be on this side or it can be on this side, but there is zero probability of finding it in the middle here. So somehow electrons are able to magically transport 
from one side of this orbital to the other without ever passing through that middle point there. All right, again, one of the weird ways in which the quantum world does not behave the same as our classical world that we're used to living in. All right, and then the last one that we're gonna talk about are what are called the d orbitals. There are also f orbitals, but we're gonna kind of gloss over them. All right, these d orbitals, just like our s and our p orbitals, they have their own distinct shape to them. To make it easy to remember, we call these daisy-shaped. All right, if we look here, it's kind of like two p orbitals crisscrossed. All right, here's our daisy shape. And again, this is just another electron cage. We have our electrons, they're zipping around our molecule. They're able to go freely between these four orbitals here, or these four lobes here, but they're stuck in that electron cage. All right, so according to that math equation, electrons can live in one of three different types of orbitals. All right, these spherical shaped S orbitals the peanut-shaped p orbitals, or the daisy-shaped d orbitals, okay? Um, much like our p orbitals, there's more than one of these d orbitals here. There's actually five of them, all right? And they all have this daisy shape, except for this one oddball here, which has that peanut shape, but then there's this donut around the outside. So most of our d orbitals are daisy shaped, except for the one random one with a donut. And where did this come from? Who, what brilliant dude came up with the donut idea? Well, again, it's the result of that math problem, right? This is a physics problem where they solved for that missing variable, and they got an equation where then they plotted it, and it looked like a freaking peanut with a donut around it. And nobody came up with this, right, except for the math. This is where this comes from here. We're just kind of putting these clever names to it like Daisy and Donut to help us remember what that big ugly math equation was saying. All right, so to summarize here, we got these orbitals. Our orbitals are like electron cages and we got three different kinds. We got our S orbital, which is spherical shaped. And there's only one of them. We got our p orbitals, which are peanut shaped. And we got three of those. And then we got our d orbital. These are daisy or donut shaped. And there are five of them. All right, this is what we need to remember about these orbitals here their shape as well as how many of them we have. Okay, we could just put down, we have our F, just for completeness here. These are complicated. We'll note that there are seven of them. You can see that we have increasing odd numbers here. These are only found in the very large atoms. All right, so these are only out orbitals that are found in the largest elements, the ones in the last two rows of our periodic table, which are very rare. We very rarely talk about those elements to begin with. Okay, cool. So, first thing we got to do here is we're going to learn how to look at the periodic table and by looking at an element's placement on the periodic table we're going to be able to figure out the type of electrons that make up that atom right so looking at the periodic table we're going to say oh carbon it's got a bunch of s orbital electrons and some p orbital electrons right so that's what we need to be able to do is to look at the periodic table and figure out what the electronic structure of an atom is does it have s P or D electrons, all right? That's the name of the game here. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our periodic table and we're gonna learn how to cut it up. All right. Here is our periodic table. 
And we've cut it up before talking about, you know, our halogens and our alkali earth metals. This is going to be similar here. Based on where an element lives on the periodic table, we can tell what type of electrons are making up that uh, atom. All right, so these first two rows. This is what we call the S block. All right, and one thing to note about this S block here, I left this open space because helium really lives on the wrong side of the periodic table. We put it over there because it's a noble gas, because it indeed has that full valence shell, but it's only got two electrons in it, right? It's really tiny compared to the rest of them. So helium should actually be over here as the second element in our S block. All right, over here on this side of the periodic table, this is what we call the P block. The very middle of our periodic table, where our transition metals live, this is what we call the D block. <laughs> All right, and then lastly, the ones that we're not really going to talk very much about, but just for the sake of completeness, this one down here, this is our F block. All right, so if we take our periodic table and we cut it up into these different blocks, and of course notice that they correspond to these different orbital shapes, the S, the P, the D, and the F. All right. Based on where uh, the uh, element lives on our periodic table, that tells us the last orbital that that, electro, uh, that that atom has. All right, so in addition to cutting it up, we need to be able to number our rows here. All right, so for our S block, when we start numbering the rows of our S block, we're going to start counting at 1. So this is the 1S row, 2S, 3S, 4, whoa. 5s, 6s, 7s. All right, so for our s block, when we were counting, we started at 1. We're going to do the same thing for our p block, except for we're going to start counting at 2. So this is the 2p row, 3p, 4p, 5p, 6p, and that last one would be the 7p. All right, so S, we start at 1. P, we start at 2. If we move on to the D, what do we think we're going to start at? 3. So the first row here in our D block is what's called the 3D row. So for our D block, we're starting to number at 3, then 4, 5, 6. And then lastly, what do you think for the F block? 4. All right, so we're going to take a look at what are called electron configurations. All right, our electron configurations are a list of all electrons in an atom. We got this list of all the different electrons in an atom. That's what we call the electron configuration of that atom. And again, the first thing we had to do is cut up our periodic table. Into the S, P, D, and F blocks. Then we went in and we numbered our rows for S. We started at 1.
For P, we started at 2. For D, we started at 3. And for F, we started at 4. All right, cool. So now we're going to start taking a look at these electron configurations here. Um, I'm going to give you a few. I'm going to give you one, and we're just going to kind of pick it apart, and then we'll work on how we get these from, uh, from scratch here. All right, so hydrogen, this very first element on our periodic table. If I'm holding a neutral hydrogen atom in my hands with its one proton, how many electrons am I holding if it's, only, if it's a neutral atom? Just one, right? So our hydrogen atom, its electron configuration is it's in this S block, right? So it's got an S electron, and it's only got one of them, all right? And since it's in the first row, we call it a 1S electron, okay? So this is our electron configuration for a hydrogen atom. So let's make sure, we let's pick this apart here. So again, the S corresponds to our orbital shape. That's spherical shaped cage where that electron lives. The superscript is the number of electrons in that orbital. All right, and this one, because it lived in that first row, this is what we call the principal quantum number. All right, there are 1s orbitals, there are also 2s orbitals and 3s orbitals. They differ by that principal quantum number. All right, so what is that principal quantum number? All right, let's take a look at a few different s orbitals here. There we go. All right, importantly, that principal quantum number corresponds to the relative size of those orbitals. So if we look here at 1s orbitals versus 2s orbitals versus 3s orbitals, they all have that same spherical shape, but they're increasing in size. All right, so the larger the principal quantum number, the larger the size of that orbital. All right, that's what you want to have tied in your mind. That principal quantum number corresponds to the size of that orbital. All right. Uh, it also turns out that as you increase in your number of principal quantum number, you introduce nodes into your electron orbital. All right, so nodes, these are really weird. These are areas of zero probability. meaning you will never find an electron there. Okay, and so for each increasing principal quantum number, you introduce a new node. This is an area of zero probability. And again, this just corresponds to the magic of an electron, the idea that it can sit here in the middle or it can move to that outer area without ever passing through that node there, right? So these nodes are just these introductions of these transport, these like teleporting areas of these electrons. They can be in either one of these two areas, but they move without ever passing through the middle there. All right, so let's go back to our periodic table. We said that hydrogen, its electron configuration was 1s1. The first one is the principal quantum number, so we have a tiny spherical shaped orbital where this one electron is living. All right, so now we're going to move over to helium. Helium is the second element on the periodic table. So if I'm holding a neutral helium atom in my hand, how many electrons does it have? 
two. All right, so we're going to figure out where those two electrons live. Let's note that helium is still in this one S row here. Whoa. All right, helium is the second element in this one S row. So it's also got a 1s configuration. But how many electrons live in that 1s orbital? Now it's going to be two electrons. All right. We can tell because helium is the one, two second element in that 1s row. All right, so we're going to move on to the next smallest element, a lithium atom. Lithium's element three on our periodic table. Lithium lives in that S block, right? But it's in the two row here. All right, so where an element is on the periodic table tells you what the last orbital that the, uh, in its electron configuration. So lithium is the first element of the 2s row. So the last orbital in its electron configuration is 2s1. All right? First element of the 2s row. All right, but how many electrons does a lithium atom have if it's neutral? Three, and there's only one electron in my electron configuration here. So where are the other two? So importantly, every larger atom contains all the smaller electrons of everything that came before it. So where this element lives on the periodic table tells me the last uh, orbital in its electron configuration, but I have to include everything that came before it. Lithium's element three. So if I look before it, I'm talking about this right here, which isn't the 2s, but the 1s row. And it's got two electrons because it's completely full. All right, so where an element lives is going to tell us what the last orbital is in its electron configuration. And then we got to include everything that became before it. All right, so we number our rows, our elements position. Tells us the last orbital in its electron configuration. And then we have to include everything that came before it. All right, so this might seem a little puzzling at first. I promise once we do a few examples here, you'll get the hang of it. It's not too bad. It's just a little bit weird of a process here. We're going to find our element on our periodic table. Based on its position, we know what the last orbital in its electron configuration is, and then we include everything that came before it. So let's just go through that process for a few examples here. All right, so we did lithium. Let's do the next two elements in line here. Let's do beryllium and let's do boron. All right, we're going to do these together, and then there, uh, we'll let you all loose to do a few examples on your own here. All right, so we're going in order of our small elements here. So beryllium is element four on my periodic table, so I'm going to have a total of four electrons in its electron configuration. Beryllium is the second element of the 2s row. So its last orbital in its electron configuration is 2s2. But then I got to include everything that came before it. And what comes before 
this row here, if I look at my number, I gotta go to the next number in line. That would be my 1s row. So beryllium's electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2. A total of four electrons. And again, what is this electron configuration corresponding to? It's telling me that of beryllium's four electrons, two of them live in a tiny sphere, and the other two live in a slightly larger sphere, right? They're trapped in those electron orbitals. All right, so now we're going to move on to boron. Boron is now all the way over here in this P block. All right, and remember, we start numbering our P block at two. So this row here would correspond to what? 2P, right? This is now the 2P row here. And this is my first element in my 2P row. So my last electron configure or my last orbital in my electron configuration is 2P1. Right? The first element of that 2P block. But again, I got to include everything that came before it. So boron's element 5. I'm going to look for element 4. And where does element 4 live? What do we call this one? 2s. And now that, it's, now that I'm past it, it's completely full. So this will be 2s2. And then what comes before 2s? 1s. Right? So notice how these larger atoms, they contain the electron configuration of the smaller elements that came before it. All right, so let's do, I want you all to try to do two of these on your own here. Let's do oxygen and magnesium. All right, so what is the last orbital in oxygen's electron configuration? 2p, right, because oxygen lives over here in the 2p row. And how many electrons are in that 2p orbital? Four, because it's the fourth element in that 2p row. But then I got to include everything that came before it. So what's right in front of 2p? 2s, right? Look at your atomic numbers. This is element 5, so I need to look where element 4 lives. This is the 2s row. And it's full, so it's 2s2. And then lastly before that is my 1s. All right? 
Um, magnesium, what's going to be the last orbital in its electron configuration? Not 2s, 3s, because now we're all the way in the third row of our s block. So now we have 3s. And how many electrons live in that 3s orbital? Two, because it's the second element in that block. So 3s. And then I got to include everything that came before it. So what's right in front of 3s? Awesome. OK, so look, our atomic number. I'm looking here. I'm not going to jump up here, because that's atomic number four. I'm skipping a whole bunch of electrons there. I need to look what's in front of 11, 10. So I'm talking about this row here. So 2p. And how many electrons can we fit in that 2p block? Six, right? When it's completely full, it's got a total of the one, you know, counting my rows here. One, two, three, four, five, six electrons. And in front of the 2p is the 2s, and in front of the 2s is the 1s. All right, so that's the name of our game here. All right, let's do two more examples. Uh, I'll leave one of these up as a reference here. All right, but I want you to do chlorine and neon. All right, so if I look at where chlorine lives on my periodic table, what's going to be the last orbital in chlorine's electron configuration? It's in the third row of the P block. So the last orbital in chlorine's electron configuration is going to be 3P. And how many electrons live in that 3P orbital? Five, because it is the fifth column of that 3p row. But now I got to include everything that came before that 3p row as well. So what's right in front of 3p? The 3s, right? So if we look, here's my 3p row. Starts at element 13, so I need to jump back to element 12. That's my 3s row. And what comes before 3s? The 2p, right? So again, looking at atomic number, it's tempting to jump up here, but we're missing this whole row here. So 2p, and there can be six electrons in that 2p orbital. In front of that is 2s, and in front of that is 1s. All right, so 
Again, based on where the element lives on our periodic table, neon. That tells us the last orbital in neon's electron configuration is 2p. And since it's the last element in that 2p row, it's got six electrons. And then everything that came before that would be the 2s and then finally the 1s. All right, so here are our electron configurations. Okay. Now, again, the process might be a little weird. As soon as you practice it a few times, you'll have it down. The nice thing is, is that chlorine's electron configuration is always chlorine's electron configuration, right? So there's a finite number of elements that I can choose from and ask you what the electron configuration is. Now, clearly the further down on this periodic table I go, the more of a pain in the butt it is to get the electron configuration because it's got all these smaller orbitals that came before it. So next time, what we'll start out with is what's called the noble gas abbreviation, where I can sort of take chlorine's electron configuration. And I can say, look, this part right here matches that of the next smallest noble gas neon. So I can abbreviate chlorine's electron configuration using neons followed by these other orbitals you got to fill in. All right, so that's what we'll pick up with next time is how to do these abbreviated electron configurations. Cool. What's up? Yeah, yeah, it's that same framework that we needed for the transition metals, yep. They, we won't go to the next step, which is looking at those crystal field splitting diagrams. Oh, they will? They will not. Okay. That's what we needed it for in your course, right? Yeah. But I still should be able to pick a, uh, an element in the D block and have them give me the electron configuration. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yep. So like, if we were to do iron, the last element in its electron configuration would be 3D. And since iron's element one, two, three, four, five, six, its last orbital in its electron configuration would be 3d6. We'll do, we'll do bigger. We, we, we've only done the first three rows, right? We'll do larger and larger elements as we go. Hey, I want to talk to you about my exam. OK. Mine was the one with the alarm in Oh, yeah, OK. Look, I know I kind of made a mistake. Is there anywhere I can just get the 13 minutes? Um, let me take a look at your exam and we'll figure it out. At this point, you've seen the exam, so it's not fair to let you go back and revisit it, right? I understand. So, yeah. So, let me see what's complete and what's not, and we'll take it from there. Got it. All right. Thank you. Yep. It's not, but it's it's not my favorite, so I don't rip wear very often. How was your weekend? It was good. Um, not not terribly long. It, it melted by the end of the day, but just that morning. Yeah, that was weird. I gotta say, not that I don't enjoy your lectures, but I was pretty excited. I'm sure everybody was just very wounded by not having class that day. You know what? Heartbroken. Yeah. Yeah. I was half tempted to be oh, like, snap. I can pick you up. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, I can pick you up.